class of 2016, we come together today to celebrate your achievement, a culmination of years of hard work and personal sacrifice. Today is a rite of passage, signifying the end of one identity and the beginning of another. As part of your Knox education, each of you have been encouraged to examine how you fit into societal structures of power and privilege. Starting today, regardless of whatever advantages you possessed or lacked when you came to campus four years ago, all of you now have at least one privilege in common, a college education. Less than 35% of Americans of your generation hold four-year college degrees, and on a global scale, you will constitute less than 7% of the world's population. Whether you like it or not, today you enter a privileged sector of society. Whatever personal anxieties you might have at this moment about your immediate future, the reality is that as a group and over the course of your lives, you will have more resources, have more political influence, and generally have happier lives than the vast majority of human beings on the planet. But with this privilege comes responsibility. As the Bible says in Luke 12, 48, everyone to whom much was given, of him much will be required. Or as Spider-Man says in Amazing Stories 862, with great, great power, there must also come great responsibility. So the question is, what is your responsibility as a college educated person? If we, your professors, have done our job as your teachers, and if you, our pupils, have done your job as students, then each of you is now prepared to answer this question for yourself. Not immediately, to be sure. A question such as this is a lifelong pursuit, with a specific answer different for each of you, and always in flux. But you now have the intellectual tools and skills to make your pursuit a meaningful one. Today, no doubt, you will hear much from the assembled speakers on this stage that will assist you in contemplating your new responsibility. It may also help to reflect upon the fact that your commencement falls on the 50th anniversary of Desmond Tutu's graduation from King's College in London with a degree in theology. In thinking about his half century of religious leadership and social activism, the Archbishop said, in our African language we say, a person is a person through other persons. We are made for a delicate network of relationships of interdependence. And as countryman and colleague Nelson Mandela put it, what counts in life is not the mere fact that we have lived. It is what difference we have made to the lives of others that will determine the significance of the life we lead. Please be seated. Good morning. On behalf of Knox College, I welcome all of you to the 171st Knox College commencement. Pretty good. That's a pretty good number. As many of you know, Knox was founded in 1837, so we have a very long history to draw upon. And as we begin our ceremony, I invite all of you to look back with me a hundred years ago to what the commencement at Knox College was like back in 1916. The, th the 71st commencement was held in the Central Congregational Church on the square on June 8th. The church was packed well before the ceremony began, in part because it featured not one but five commencement addresses and two musical interludes. What were the topics of that day? Helen Barden spoke on pioneer life in Illinois, acknowledging that with all the, as she said, modern means of transportation and communication, our many conveniences and luxuries, it was hard to recall that only 75 years ago, 
pioneers settled the then new state of Illinois. And she reflected on the hard times they overcame and the social bonds they formed. Edith Wiggle spoke next, giving what the newspaper account of the day called a unique oration on representative poets of Illinois. One of the poets she referred to belonged to a movement called the New Localism. This poet urged young people like yourselves, graduates, to become, in her words, devout gardeners, architects, musicians, novelists, poets, dramatists, actors, or singers, and to wander over the whole nation and then come back to their little hearth and neighborhood and gather a circle of their own sort of workers about them and strive to make the neighborhood and the home more beautiful and democratic and holy with their special art. Robert Stevens spoke next about improving trade with South America, advocating for a feeling of sympathy and mutual interest to unite the two continents. Following him, L. Ray Wampler spoke about World War I, which to the horror of many that day continued in Europe. And finally, Hugh Rawson spoke on peace through justice. His idealism shines through in phrases such as this. International peace means the creation of an all-prevailing sense of justice, a sense of justice strong enough to overcome racial, religious, and national prejudices. For enduring peace is possible only when it is based upon equilibrium, upon equality, and upon fundamental justice. The creating of justice has been the most absorbing task of civilization. So today, when we celebrate the achievements of the students, soon to be our graduates, we're reminded that the orators of 100 years ago were reminded by them of the enduring beliefs that have guided Knox College over the years. Courageous exploration toward the truth belief in the transformative power of the arts and community, and the ongoing pursuit of justice for all. Bali Laka is from an Indian Bollywood film and is in the language of Tamil. We sing of our love for our cultural traditions and our hope that we can hold on to the best of these traditions as we move into the future and face the challenges of modern life.
Welcome to the 171st Commencement Proceedings of Nas College. My name is Teresa Amant. It is my great privilege and my honor to serve this fine institution as Knox's 19th president. For 171 years, families and friends of the graduates have made the journey to Galesburg by train and other means to witness the moment at which their special graduate walked across the stage to receive a degree from Knox College. I want us to remember that this moment has been made possible by the entire Knox community, our distinguished faculty, and our remarkable staff. And among these many special people who have cared for you during these years, let us today recognize and thank the campus safety, facilities, and dining service workers who make this campus a beautiful and welcoming home for all of us and a beautiful and welcoming place to visit on this magnificent commencement day. Graduates, please take a moment to applaud the faculty and the staff. And while we're thanking people, let us also thank your families and your friends for all they have done to make this day possible.
It is now my privilege to confer the honorary degrees upon the recipients selected by the Board of Trustees for this 171st commencement. Knox College awarded its first honorary doctorate to Abraham Lincoln in 1860. And in a letter to Mr. Lincoln, Knox trustee Orville Browning assured him that Knox is destined to become one of the most useful colleges in, in, in the land. And in after time, it will be no discredit to you that you received your degree at her hands. And Mr. Browning, Browning's prediction did come true. Knox indeed became one of the most useful colleges in the land, and it has con continued its tradition of awarding degrees to individuals of great distinction. By selecting these individuals of demonstrated merit for recognition with honorary doctorates, the Board of Trustees invites them into an enduring relationship with this college, for the degrees carry the weight of the history, traditions, and values of this college. They are conferred with care and with deep respect for those whose lives and deeds we are privileged to honor. Professor Allison will present the first candidate for an honorary degree. President Amat, I am honored to present Chad Pragraki, founder of Living Lands and Waters, a nonprofit organization dedicated to cleaning up and preserving our nation's rivers for the degree of Doctor of Humane Letters. Chad Pragraki grew up in Hampton, Illinois with the Mississippi River serving as his backyard. He spent his summer breaks from high school and college working on both the Mississippi and Illinois rivers as a commercial fisherman, shell diver, and barge hand. He camped on the river's islands and shorelines to save money and fuel and quickly noticed how neglected the rivers were with an unsightly and toxic accumulation of trash along their banks. This neglect prompted him at the age of 17 to start making calls to government agencies notifying them of the problem. Not happy with the response, he soon decided that if no one else was going to clean up the rivers, he would do it himself. In 1998, at the age of 23, Chad founded Living Lands and Waters. Since its founding, the organization has grown to include 10 full-time employees, a fleet of five barges, two towboats, five work boats, two skid loaders, seven work trucks, an excavator, and a crane. With this equipment, the crew is able to travel and work in an average of nine states a year along the Mississippi, Illinois, Ohio, Missouri, and other rivers, as well as many of their tributaries. The organization's mission also includes educational workshops and the Million Trees Project. Over the last 18 years, Living Lands and Waters, um, and Chad told me this morning, they've just about cleared 100,000 volunteers, have removed almost 9 million pounds of garbage from 23 rivers in 20 states. The millions of pounds of garbage, 85% of which is later recycled, has included at most recent count, one combine harvester, how that got out, I don't know, <laughs> four pianos, 13 hot tubs, 105 bowling balls, 225 <laughs> washing machines, 1,105 refrigerators, <laughs> and more than 78,000 tires, to name just a few items. In recognition of his preservation work, Pergaki's vision and leadership have garnered him a number of awards and honors over the years, including the Jefferson Award for Public Service in June 2002, and the Illinois Environmental Hero Award in 2007. He was named a CNN Hero of the Year in 2013 and is the author of From the Bottom Up, One Man's Crusade to Clean America's Rivers, and he tours the globe as an environmental speaker. Chad Pergaki is proof that one person can make a difference. What started as a personal commitment at the age of 17 to help clean up his local environment has grown into a movement that has engaged more than 95, well, almost 100,000 people around the world. As he told CNN in 2013, change is slow like a barge or train, but once it builds momentum, it is hard to stop. President Amat, in recognition of his heroic efforts to clean and preserve our nation's waterways, I present Chad Pergaki for the degree of Doctor of Humane Letters. By the authority of the General Assembly of the State of Illinois, vested in the Board of Trustees, 
at, by Knox College and by them delegated to me, I hereby confer upon you the degree Doctor of Humane Letters Honoris Causa with all the privileges, honors, and dignities which here and elsewhere pertain to that degree. is a little challenging up here, so I'm having to wait my script before it goes flying off into the, into the audience. If it does, I'd appreciate it if you would chase after it and give it back to me, because I need it. Professor Denial will present the second candidate for an honorary degree. President Amat, I am honored to present Brenda J. Child, a leading scholar of American Indian history for the degree of Doctor of Humane Letters. Author and historian Brenda J. Child was born on the Red Lake Ojibwe Reservation in northern Minnesota and has dedicated her scholarly research and work to documenting and exploring the interactions between Ojibwe people and the state in the 19th and 20th centuries, helping to redress an imbalance in what mo most non-Native people know about the Native past. Professor Child received her PhD in history at the University of Iowa and was a fellow at the School of American Research, Santa Fe, New Mexico. A professor in the Department of American Studies at the University of Minnesota, she has taught American history for more than 20 years, specializing in American Indian history, native culture, and multiculturalism. Her department also offers Dakota and Ojibwe language study. She is the author of Boarding School Seasons, American Indian Families, 1900 to 1940, which won the North American Indian Prose Award in 1998, and Holding the World Together, Ojibwe Women and the Survival of Community, and the co-author of Indian Subjects, Hemispheric Perspectives on the History of Indigenous Education. Her most recent publication, My Grandfather's Knocking Sticks, Ojibwe Family Life and Labor on the Reservation combines a family memoir of her grandparents' working lives with a broader history of others of their generation. My Grandfather's Knocking Sticks won the 2014 American Indian Book Award and the 2014 John Jurde Prize for the Best Book in Midwestern History as awarded by the Midwestern History Association. The selection committee for the Jurde Prize praised Child's memoir as an eloquent study of family life, which locates personal experience in the larger experience of the Ojibwe people and the Midwest as a whole. In addition to her scholarship, Professor Child is a member of the Board of Trustees of the Minnesota Historical Society and the Smithsonian's National Museum of the American Indian, and is a member of the Native American Council of the Idol Jorg Museum of Art in Indianapolis, Indiana. She is also part of a research group that developed the Ojibwe People's Dictionary, which launched as a website in 2012, assisting in the reclamation and strengthening of the Ojibwe language as a spoken, living language. The project was supported with funds from Minnesota's Historical and Cultural Heritage Fund and National Science Foundation. A citizen of the Red Lake Band of the Chippewa Nation, Professor Child is one of 10 members of a committee writing a new Red Lake Constitution. Her continued work for her community in both language reclamation and constitutional revision speak eloquently of her passion for the continued flourishing of the Ojibwe people. President Amat, in recognition of her contributions to the history of the Ojibwe people, and her support of a new telling of American Indian history for a general audience, I present Brenda Child for the degree of Doctor of Humane Letters. By the authority delegated to me, I hereby confer upon you the degree Doctor of Humane Letters, honoris causa, with all the privileges, honors, and dignities 
which here and elsewhere pertain to that degree. President Amat, Board of Trustees, faculty, staff, my fellow recipients of honorary degrees, Dr. Chad Pregracki, Dr. Brenda Child, thank you for this honor. Congratulations, Knox College Class of 2016, to your parents, grandparents, family and friends who stood by you, cheered you on, helped you to get here today. This is your, their day as well. Let's give a big round of applause to all the family and friends that made it possible. Special thanks to Knox College for this honorary degree. It means a great deal coming from the same college that awarded Abraham Lincoln his only college degree. I'm certainly in good company. Of course, let's be honest. When I look at your previous commencement speakers, I know I'm only here because Jimmy Kimmel just wasn't available. <laughs> it's, it's, turns out I actually know someone who was here at Knox in 2006 when Stephen Colbert gave the commencement address. This sophomore had to skip the ceremony, if you can imagine, because he just started an internship and his new boss needed him to drive him around in Southern Illinois that same day. Terrible luck. The reason I know that story is because I was that boss and Brad Middleton was that intern. Brad is here today, only he's not an intern anymore. Brad, please stand up. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, Brad Middleton, Knox College Class of 2008, is my chief education advisor in Washington. Brad is working in the United States Senate to advance the same principle that Knox College has embraced for 179 years, the idea that higher education is not a privilege reserved only for the well-off and the well-connected. Now, Brad is part of a proud tradition of Knox College graduates who have gone on to Washington. Just outside my Capitol office is the official portrait of a Knox College grad Senator Hiram Revels, the first African American ever elected to the United States Congress. The man who for a time in the post-Civil War era occupied the same Senate seat held by Jefferson Davis, President of the Confederate States. And of course, there's my friend in Washington, John Podesta. Class of 71, X-Files fanatic, legendary political progressive, Chief of Staff to President Bill Clinton, Special Advisor to a good friend of Knox College, President Barack Obama. So we're expecting great things from you, Class of 2016. I can't think of a more tenacious, more courageous bunch of graduates. I mean, look at you. Just look at you. All wearing your robes. Now, usually when you're wearing, still wearing your robe at 1030 on a Sunday morning, it means you've given up completely. But I know better. You haven't given up, you're fired up. Some would say prairie fired up. <laughs> and thank goodness, you need to hold on to that passion and determination. Because at the risk of putting a damper on the festivities, the world is a little crazy right now. There's a whole lot of chaos out there. And you're going to need all the courage and tenacity that you can muster. Now I know that I'm, not, that I'm the only thing standing between you, your diploma, and a well-deserved celebration. So I don't want to keep you for long, and I'm not the first of five commencement speakers. But I do want to share with you three stories. Thomas Friedman. He's an author and a columnist for the New York Times. He connects the dots that a lot of people don't even see. A few weeks ago, he came by my office. I asked him, what is going on in this world? Why is there so much unheaval, upheaval, and what can we do about it? This is what he told me. He started by saying that politics in America used to work. We used to talk to each other. We'd identify big problems and come to a consensus about fixing them. That's who Americans were. Idealists, pragmatists, all rolled up into one. The process was slow, don't get me wrong, but it worked. Not anymore. The way Thomas Friedman sees it, America and the entire world are being rad radically and ra rapidly reshaped 
by the three of the most powerful forces on earth. He calls them the three M's, the market, Moore's law, and mother nature. Now the market, of course, means economic globalization, the ability of money and jobs to move almost anywhere. Moore's law is a theory first articulated by a man named Gordon Moore who co-founded Intel. 51 years ago, Gordon Moore predicted that computing power would basically double every two years and computers would become exponentially smaller and cheaper. Think about what you're carrying in your pocket. Many people thought his idea was science fiction. At the time, mainframe computers were as large as classrooms and it took an accomplished scientist to operate one. Today, we all carry around more powerful computers in our pockets and hand a toddler a computer and watch what happens as they make sense of the basics of that little piece of machinery. Now the third force reshaping our world as Tom Friedman sees it, and I'm glad to see our Mother Earth flag here today, is Mother Nature, especially population growth and climate change. Think about it. The globalization of the economy has helped lift hundreds of millions of people, especially women, out of poverty in some of the poorest nations on Earth. It has produced a vast array of easy to afford goods around the world. But just like the moment when the focus of the American economy shifted from farms to factories, this economic transformation to global supply and demand has caused some real pain. Galesburg knows that story in Maytag. It has left millions of men and women in America and other developed nations without jobs or enough money to raise their families. Lightning fast advances in computer power the spread of the internet means that climbers atop Mount Everest have access to cell phone service. Self-driving cars are on the road. I rode in the Google car on a California expressway and couldn't believe it when the driver turned around to talk to me. Poor children in sub-Saharan Africa can connect to the internet via, pardon me, can connect via the internet to the best libraries in the world. At the same time, technological advances are helping to, provide, to topple old power structures as people become more aware and less willing to accept the vast inequities of wealth and opportunity in the world. At its darkest, at its darkest, the technology of social media is used to spread hate and even kill. I don't care how many times a certain fair and balanced news channel denies it, climate change is real. It is accelerating. We are the first generation to see this with clarity, and we may be one of the last to be able to do something about it. Chad Pergracki, in your small way, you are making a contribution to that effort. Now this, this is a threat to the planet we live on. It's also a cause of turmoil in the developing world, and it's caused the migration crises that we read about almost every single day. Just two days ago, I returned from South Africa where an historic drought threatens to throw one-fourth of the farmers in that nation into bankruptcy and displace rural populations into overcrowded cities. These overcrowded cities now house a population with the highest HIV infection rate on Earth and a public health system totally unready for further challenge. Put all of these forces together, markets, Moore's Law, Mother Nature, and the world is changing at a dizzying pace that's stressing governments, transforming the way we work, shrinking the middle class, and leaving many, many people anxious, angry, and vulnerable to demagogues and extremists. Let's not overlook our own country, where a very highly publicized candidate tries to parlay populist anger into the presidency. We've seen political candidates like him before. In fact, we've seen, him on the Knox, seen them on the Knox College campus. In 1858, an enormous crowd of people gathered around Old Main, just as we are now. They estimate 10 to 20,000 people showed up. Those thousands of spectators heard candidate Abraham Lincoln say more clearly than he ever had before that slavery was not simply a political wrong, it was a moral evil that threatened the existence of our nation. In front of Old Main, Abraham Lincoln said, the American democracy must rest on the principle that's greater than might makes right. For our democracy to be more than simply mob rule, he said, it must have a moral core. And that moral core for Abraham Lincoln was the revolutionary promise of the Declaration of Independence. All men and women are created equal. 
Lincoln was calling on our divided, angry nation to seek the ties that bind us together. In his day, Lincoln said that America must look beyond the divisive issue of race. In his time, race was as personal and painful as our debates today over color, gender, religion, immigration, and sexual orientation. Facing Lincoln in 1858 on the other podium was a candidate who many, and none more than himself, regarded as the most spellbinding speaker in America. He was known by his fans as the Little Giant. His only governing principle was popular sovereignty, majority rule. Whatever the majority wanted, it should have. It was an easy, appealing, populist message. It celebrated the things that divided us and avoided facing the hard choices over the essential values that were part of the creation of this nation. Lincoln's opponent accommodated the voters' prejudices and fears with his plan in his day for making America great again. In Lincoln's words, his opponent was blowing out the moral lights around us with his appeal to voters. Now, Lincoln may have won the debate, but he lost the Senate race that year in 1858 when the Illinois legislature chose his opponent. Time showed us that Lincoln's loss was the world's gain. Had he won the Senate seat, he might never have been president. And without President Lincoln, his strength of character, his determination to make America true to its founding promises, the American experiment might have ended on a Civil War battlefield. Now for four days, you have walked, four years, I'm sorry, you have walked on this campus, it was four years, you have walked on this campus on historic ground where Lincoln taught us a timeless lesson. The lesson's this, progress is a long march. It demands patience, perseverance, and flexibility. And at times, it requires wisdom and the humility needed to compromise. Nowadays, compromise is a concept that's been wrongly scorned as capitulation, cowardice, corruption. The truth is, in a democracy as large and diverse as ours, compromise is necessary and sometimes the only way to move forward. Many of you saw the Steven Spielberg movie Lincoln. Daniel Day-Lewis played Lincoln. There's a scene where President Lincoln is talking with Congressman Thaddeus Stevens of Pennsylvania, played by Tommy Lee Jones. Stevens, as you may know, was one of the most righteous, uncompromising abolitionists in all of American history. Thank goodness for him. But in the movie, he tells Lincoln that there's no use appealing to white people's sense of moral decency to end slavery. He says, quote, you know, the inner compass that should direct the soul toward justice has ossified in white men and women, North and South, into utter useful, uselessness through tolerating the evil of slavery. Listen to what Lincoln said in reply. A compass, I learned about those when I was surveying. It'll point you to true North from where you're standing, but it's got no advice about the swamps and desert and chasm that you'll encounter along the way. He goes on to say, if in pursuit of your destination, you plunge ahead, heedless of obstacles, and achieve nothing more than to sink in a swamp, what's the use of knowing true north? You're fortunate to have a diploma soon from Knox College. Your education here in many ways is a primer for life's lessons that lie ahead. And one of the most important is how to use your principles and still survive those swamps of real life conflict. Many of you, 2016, have spoken out against gender discrimination and sexual violence. You have taken a principled stand against injustices in America's criminal justice system, injustices that disproportionately harm poor people, people with mental illness, and people of color. I commend you for that. The old Jim Crow was wrong, and the new Jim Crow is wrong. And you are right, it must end. So let's bring Lincoln back to the campus for just a moment and speak to this issue. Back in the 1970s, America declared a war on drugs. In the 1980s, a new drug showed up, mostly in poor neighborhoods of color. It was called crack cocaine. We were told, incorrectly, that crack was far more powerful, lethal, and abusive, and addictive than powder cocaine. America panicked. Washington and Springfield joined the chorus. Congress and state legislatures all over the country passed many get-tough drug laws. 
that we now know were based on a false premise. This war on drugs hasn't stopped drug use in America. Look at the opioid and heroin epidemic we're facing now. What the war on drugs has done is to fill America's jails and prisons, not with the drug kingpins that it was supposed to take off the street, but with thousands, tens of thousands, of nonviolent drug offenders, mostly poor people of color. The numbers tell the story. The United States of America has 5% of the world's population. We have 25% of the world's prisoners. America today locks up black people at a far higher rate than South Africa did at the height of apartheid. And the price tag is considerable. On average, $30,000 a year to put a nonviolent offender in an American prison. The billions that we spend each year on over-incarceration is money we don't have for community policing or alternatives to incarceration that would even reduce recidivism more, and they would cost four or less. The money we spent incarcerating nonviolent drug offenders for years and decades is money we don't have for education, job training, or medical research to cure the disease of addiction. It is money we don't have to expand access to good mental health care and effective substance abuse treatment programs. Days ago, we learned that it was an opioid overdose that killed Prince. As awful as it is to lose his talent to addiction, the greater tragedy is that he is far from alone. 77 Americans die every day from opioid overdoses. We must change the way we treat pain and prevent addiction in our country. Now, one of the worst things that we did in the war on drugs was a 1986 federal law creating drastic, harsher punishment for offenses involving crack cocaine. A person arrested with five grams of crack received the same mandatory minimum sentence as someone arrested with 500 grams of cocaine. Pharmacologically, they were the same. Our approach was certainly tough, but it wasn't smart. So six years ago, I introduced the Fair Sentencing Act to correct this mistake. It eliminated the five-year mandatory minimum sentence for simple possession of crack. It dramatically reduced the crack powder disparity. And here's where a willingness to compromise was essential. I wanted to eliminate this disparity completely, but I'm only one of 100 senators, and I needed 50 colleagues to join me to accomplish anything. The best I could negotiate six years ago was to narrow the disparity from 100 to 1 to 18 to 1. I hated that compromise. I didn't want to replace a law that was 100 times wrong with one that was 18 times wrong. It was a matter of principle. But then I came to realize that if I only kept my eye on true north, I would sink into a swamp of futility. I took 18 to 1. The bill passed the House and Senate unanimously. The bipartisan U.S. Sentencing Commission recently analyzed the Fair Sentencing Act that we passed six years ago. They found that in the first four years after President Obama signed this law, almost 13,000 nonviolent crack offenders were carefully and individually reviewed and approved for sentence reduction. Those sentence reductions totaled 30,000 fewer years in prison. 80% of these offenders were African American. Had I refused to compromise, many of these men and women would still be subject to these old, extreme, long sentences. In some cases, sentences longer than those we impose for the crime of murder. I'm working on a new bill with Attorney General Loretta Lynch, Senator Cory Booker of New Jersey, two very conservative Republican senators, Chuck Grassley of our neighboring state of Iowa, Mike Lee, a Tea Party Republican of Utah. It's a larger criminal justice reform bill. It's been endorsed by the major civil rights groups, ACLU, NAACP, but it's also been endorsed by the largest organization of criminal prosecutors. It's an indication of when you cross party lines and work for a compromise, you can bring together those people of different political persuasions. Let me tell you one story that explains why I believe that we need to continue to seek allies to solve these problems. A few months ago, I met a na man named Alton Mills. He grew up on the south side of Chicago. His choices in life were very different from what many of us faced. Alton says there were only three things in his neighborhood in the early 1990s. You could play sports, be a mechanic, or sell drugs. He chose sports as his ticket, but then a bad knee injury ended that aspiration. He tried to steer clear of gangs and drugs. He got a job, then he lost it. Then for two years, he carried crack and cocaine for drug dealers. 
he was one of those young kids, those runners. He made a couple hundred bucks. The kingpins were making thousands. Alton was arrested twice for possession of small amounts of crack. Then police arrested the entire ring, the entire drug operation. Now the high rollers in that drug operation decided to get a lesser sentence by ratting out Alton Mills, turning on him. It worked for them. The judge looked at Alton Mills and his two earlier arrests at the sentencing and said, my hands are tied. The law says three strikes and you're out. I have to sentence you to life in prison without parole. Alton was 24 years old, just about your age, and he'd never spent a day in jail in his life. Now he was headed for a life sentence. But he had one thing going for him. He never lost hope. His mom and dad never gave up on him. And then God sent him an angel. I'm not kidding. He found an incredible, dedicated lawyer, a public defender, an attorney more interested in doing something meaningful than making money. Her name, my angel Cody. She fought for a second chance for Alton. She was unrelenting. She knocked on every door, including mine. Then she took her case to the White House. Last year, President Obama commuted the remainder of Alton's sentence. This past January, after 22 years in federal prison, Alton Mills came home to his family. This coming January, he'll celebrate the first anniversary of his release, and he'll watch his daughter graduate from nursing school. <coughs> the Sentencing Reform and Corrections Act that I'm working on won't spare wrongdoers from paying for their crimes but it will make our criminal justice system fairer and smarter. And it will end the three strikes and you're out sentencing process that unfortunately caught up Alton Mills in its web. That will make all of the talking and negotiating, turning adversaries into friends, worth the effort. I found my true north on sentencing reform with the help of a lot of people. So here's my last point to you. Let me share another scene from Spielberg's Lincoln. The scene takes place just before dawn. Lincoln has walked two blocks from the White House to the War Department. They had a telegraph. He was using the latest in communication in his day to communicate with generals in the field. The war is coming to a close. It's taken a terrible toll on America and on the Commander-in-Chief. Hundreds of thousands have died. Lincoln has carried their deaths in his heart and his broken body shows the toll the burden has taken. President Lincoln is talking with two young army officers about your age. He asked these young officers a question. Do you think we choose the times into which we are born, or do we fit the times we are born into? Well, class of 2016, I don't know how many of you would have chosen to be born in a time to come of age at this moment, when the world is changing so fast it can make you dizzy, and old ideas and institutions are being rattled to the core. But what matters is this. You are fitted to these times with the education you've received, the values you bring to your life, and your own moral compass. You can make this world better. As a wise man once said, you now have our permission to change the world. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Durbin. I have a great deal of faith and hope that these graduates will indeed change the world. I'm not even sure they need our permission. They're going to do it. Professor Kasser will present the Faculty Achievement Award. It's my real pleasure to announce this year's winner of the Knox College Faculty Achievement Award. The Faculty Personnel Committee chooses the winner of this award each year from nominations made by faculty across campus. The Faculty Achievement Award recognizes extraordinary accomplishments in teaching, research or creative activity, and service. This year's winner is being recognized for excellence in all of these areas. The faculty member who has won this year's award is an exceptional instructor who is valued by students and colleagues alike. 
She regularly receives course evaluations from students that place her at the very top of her department. Students react so positively to her classes because she's a remarkably thoughtful teacher who always places the student at the center of the learning. She does this by continually working to tap into the many ways that Knox students learn and express their knowledge. I can personally attest to how much I've learned about teaching from her, and I know other faculty members often look to her for guidance, assistance, and inspiration. Perhaps this is part of why she's held in such high regard by her peers, who over the years have elected her to be faculty observer to the Board of Trustees and to serve on the Executive Committee and the Faculty Personnel Committee, two of the most important faculty committees on campus. Now when this year's winner came to the college, her department was in almost complete disarray. She almost immediately took over as chair and has served in that capacity for most of her career at Knox. During her time at Knox, students have flocked to her department, making it among the most popular majors on campus. These accomplishments are particularly noteworthy since she continually has to negotiate with government bureaucracies and regulations unimaginable to most of us professors. Her success in managing these challenges is clear as those bureaucracies consistently reaccredit her department at the highest level, recognizing it as one of the strongest in the state of Illinois. This year's winner has done all that while continuing her research into how children learn, particularly how they learn science. Over the last decade, she has applied her student-centered approach by researching culturally relevant pedagogy on the Navajo Nation Reservation. Each August, she has taken groups of students to teach with her on the reservation in Arizona. When students who have, who have accompanied her on these trips graduate, they frequently indicate that this was the defining experience of their college career. To say that she has changed lives with this program would be a major understatement. And so I ask you to join me in congratulating this year's winner of the Knox College Faculty Achievement Award, my very good friend, the George Appleton Lawrence Distinguished Service Professor of Educational Studies, Dr. Diana Beck. Each year, the graduating class selects one of its members to represent them on this important day by delivering the senior class speech. As is typical of an Ox education, the selection process is rigorous and challenging. I would actually say arduous. Candidates prepare a presentation. It is recorded. It is shared with the entire senior class and is also typical of Knox. A democratic process of selection ensues. The speaker receiving the largest number of votes is chosen. This year's speaker is Tanika Pradhan from Kathmandu, Nepal. Tanika majored in economics and creative writing. She is a member of Tri Delta and was elected to three honorary societies, Mortarboard, Omicron Delta Epsilon, and Order of Omega. This spring, she received the Sylvia and Erwin Jaffe Memorial Prize in Economics. My most meaningful interaction with Tanika came a little over a year ago, when you recall the catastrophic earthquake in her home country of Nepal. And in response, within minutes of the news, I received an email from Tanika asking for help in mobilizing the Knox community to respond, together with other students, those from Nepal, and those who were becoming global citizens through their years here at Knox. Tanika raised many thousands of dollars for earthquake relief. It is my great pleasure to introduce this year's senior class speaker, Tanika Pradhan.
Thank you, President Ahmad, for that incredible introduction. I sound very impressive when you put it that way. Um, but good morning to all of you present here. Thank you, friends and family, for being here to celebrate this auspicious day with us. My name is Tanika Pradhan, and I am a rising alum. As I stand here today, I am nervous, excited, happy, apologetic in advance for any time during the speech that I will mess up, and I rest assured that will happen, and incredibly proud to be a part of the exceptional graduating class of 2016. As some of you know, I am an international student from Nepal. We have a greeting we use in my country that I'm sure most of you are familiar with. Let me give you a hint. It is often used during yoga classes, and it's known to appear in meditation journals, wall decals, t-shirts, and on the ever so rare occasion, on the seat of obnoxiously pink boxer shorts that I once found while I was online. The greeting is Namaste. The word, while the word is quite fashionable, the meaning isn't very well known. Nama means bow, and te means to you. So literally translated, Namaste means I bow to you. While there are a couple of interpretations of the word, the one that resonates with me most is, the spirit within me bows and honors the spirit within you. Nepal, being a very religious country, uses the word spirit in a more divine sense. But my interpretation doesn't only look at the religious aspect. Spirit can also mean energy, drive, and motivating force. It can mean the determination to overcome challenges. It can refer to one's resolve to use mistakes as lessons rather than sources of discouragement. Today, I would like to say namaste to all my fe fellow graduating seniors because I salute and honor your spirit. The spirit it took for you to be standing here today after battling all the challenges that Knox has put us through. I honor the spirit that made you strive to excel in whatever you did. I salute you for refusing to be defined by your comfort zone, but rather breaking apart from it so that you could thrive. I honor the determination it took for you to face the everyday because everyday brought challenges new and manifold. I salute your drive for working multiple jobs and long hours to put yourselves through college because money was never a steady thing. I respect you for being the first in your families to ever get through the intimidating and grueling process that is college. I honor the spirit of you leaders who motivated and mobilized people in various organizations, clubs and teams with your vision and your drive to achieve it. I pay you respect for the sports you played, conferences you attended, shows in which you performed, honors projects you defended, majors you self-designed, articles you published, flunk days you planned, philanthropy events you gave your heart and soul to, and ultimately, all the mental and physical hardships that you had to push through. That takes spirit. I also honor the spirit of yours for the struggles you overcame that mostly went unnoticed. The spirit you were able to muster up to attend that class every day that intimidated you to no end. I salute the dedication it took for you to raise your hand and participate, even though it caused you to break into cold sweat every single time. I respect your spirit for trying out new things even though change terrified you. I am in awe of your spirit, you who worked hard to succeed in school hundreds of miles away from home. I honor you who have tried to get through college while disasters, natural or otherwise, were plaguing your hometowns. Your unyielding spirit that made you get through your classes and the demanding nature of your work and extracurriculars while constantly worrying about the safety of your loved ones. I honor you also not only for what you do, but for what you do for others. I salute your spirit in being the inspiration, the drive, the support for someone else so that they too could excel. Personally, this spirit was shown to me by the women of Delta Delta Delta, the inspiring instruments of change who have brought positivity to my life and made me realize the power of my potential. Thank you for your spirit. I salute you who have stayed up late hours studying in the libraries, various computer labs, alumni hall, the gizmo, the waiting room outside the ladies' bathroom in Seymour, <laughs> or that might have just been me. I honor the spirit of you who spend endless nights forsaking sleep to comfort friends and loved ones going through trying times. And for those of you who stayed up late just to have a good time, well, I honor you still because I'm sure you needed the mental recess for your sanity. I especially salute the spirit of those of you who made it to classes post-flunk days. 
I respect your spirit for making it through multiple winter terms, the Knox plague, and the stubborn spring allergies. They aren't a joke. I personally don't remember what it feels like to breathe through both my nostrils anymore. <laughs> that again takes spirit. Our journeys are all incredibly different, but we are united with the knowledge and satisfaction that we have overcome the trials that Knox has put us through only to emerge as wiser, stronger individuals. Take a second for that to sink in. Give yourself a metaphorical pat on the back. Now give yourself a literal pat on the back. Don't be stingy in your pride and your exuberance today. Class of 2016, you deserve every smile that you smile for every single drop of blood, sweat, and tears that you have shed on your way here. And this is just the beginning. So as we stand here today, on the threshold between here and the real world, I shall conclude by saying congratulations. And in the wise words of Effie Trinket from The Hunger Games, may the odds be ever in your favor. Thank you. This is the moment. Dean Bailing will now present the candidates for the degree Bachelor of Arts. President Ahmad, I have the honor to present to you the members of the class of 2016 who have completed the requirements for the degree of Bachelor of Arts and who have been recommended to you by the faculty. Will the candidates for the degree of Bachelor of Arts Please rise and remain standing. <clears throat> Graduates of the college, you have successfully completed the course of study prescribed by the faculty and by the authority of the General Assembly of the State of Illinois, vested in the Board of Trustees of Knox College and by them delegated to me, I hereby confer upon you the degree Bachelor of Arts with all the privileges, honors, and dignities which here and elsewhere pertain to that degree. Congratulations. As the graduates present themselves for their diplomas, I will cite those who are graduating with honors. And we ask that the audience please refrain from applause until all of the graduates have received their diplomas. Nicole Elizabeth Acton, magna cum laude, honors in theater. Hadi Ahmadi. Nicholas Stephen Alfirovic. Hamad Alazada. Claire May Allen, cum laude, honors in music theory and musicology. Lorena Patrizia Amarillo. Mackenzie Marie Anderson, cum laude. Diana Augustus. Caleb Miguel Awe. Javier Ayala.
Kyle Allen Bakey, cum laude. Edward Christopher Babbitt. Dennis Babi. Victoria Laura Baldwin. Ian Ashby Barker. Erica Elizabeth Baumgartner, cum laude, honors in psychology. <laughs> Kylie Ray Benke, summa cum laude, honors in predictive analytics. Chelsea Bennett. Ezra Fegarito Bergstein. Timothy Nicholas Berner, magna cum laude. Austin John Bevenu. Magdalena Belinska. Jasmine Renee Binion. Jamie Kading Blue, summa cum laude. Cody Allen Bowl. Madeline Rose Bame. Laura Ann Bruner. Nicholas Riley Britton, summa cum laude. Han Mi Bui. David Brendan Callahan. Bridget Silas Kalma. Alexis Marie Cameron. Zane David Carlson. Brendan Lee Carmack. Rosalinda Perez Castle. Nicholas Orlando Chapin. Diana Shavira, cum laude. Amanda Chen, cum laude. Samuel Dashen Chen. Kelly Lynn Clare, summa cum laude. Sophia Michelle Click, cum laude. Anastasia Kehonani Clifford, cum laude. Hannah Olivia Clo, cum laude. Eric Robert Coates. Samuel Howard Coffey.
Brian Allen Cole. Emma Marie Coleman. Kyle Johns Connor. Timothy John Connor. Clara Elizabeth Conover. Elena Ray Copeland. Florina Corpodian, magna cum laude. Xenophon Carl Sofel. Gabriella Grace Crivellari, cum laude. <laughs> Sophia Dunn Kroll, summa cum laude, honors in history and German. <laughs> Gavin Andrew Kroll, magna cum laude, honors in psychology. Trevor Sinclair Rogers Kernow. Laura Ray D'Angelico. Madison Jennifer Dana. Louisa Ofe Darko, cum laude. Liana Gabrielle Davis. Robin Ada Deliquis, cum laude. Keegan Marie Dome. Natalie Ann Donahue, cum laude. Shruthi Donaparthi, cum laude. Justina Alexandra Dorniak, cum laude. Maximilian Alexander Dorsey. William Black Dowling. Ryan James Downham. <laughs> Sophia Angeline Drummond Moore, magna cum laude, honors in film studies. <laughs> Margaret Grace Dubnicka. <laughs> Michaela Ann Duffy Webb, cum laude. Carolyn Agnes Dusso, cum laude. Ifiani Charles Idemba. William L. Elgin. Ilir. Imini, cum laude. Emily Taylor Finke. Ellen Sheely Fisher, summa cum laude. Anthony Michael Foley, cum laude. Anne Teresa Ford. <laughs> Emma.
Emma Mary Lewis Fry, cum laude. Alec Ryan Freitag, cum laude. Caleb Xiaoning Friedel, magna cum laude, honors in film studies. Ya Gao. Guadalupe Garcia. Vanessa Juanita Garcia. Harper Lair Garvey. Sandra Ann Gavazzi. Michael Christian Gerton. Jeremy Thomas Gogol. Mackenzie Gabrielle Goldstein. Carolina Gonsalves. Jonathan Grant. Katie Jane Grevy. Tracy Elena Guerrero Smith. Kieran Leka Gupta. Avinash Garung. Annalise Nicole Hablutzel. Jeffrey Philip Hahn. Jessica Nicole Hale. Dayu Han, Honors in Computer Science. Paul Eric Hansen. Charles Sheridan Harned, summa cum laude. Emily Marie Hastings, summa cum laude, and winner of the E. Inman Fox Prize for a student whose scholarly achievement and pursuit of a truly liberal education are exceptional among peers. <laughs> Bartholomew Boaz Hopley, cum laude. Caitlin Marie Hemby. Shannon Marie Henry, magna cum laude. William Adrian Hernandez Sector. Giovanna Ann Hernandez. Aled Irwin Hertel. Amalia Rowena Hertel, summa cum laude. <laughs> Jane Judith Hibbs Magruder. Nicole Ray Hinton. Thomas John Hintz, magna cum laude. Rebecca Jean Hickson, 
summa cum laude, honors in English literature and gender and women's studies. Stephanie Elizabeth Holly, cum laude. Jarrell Alexander Holmes. Kiera Marie Honeysucker. Daniel Hong, magna cum laude, honors in chemistry. Aaron Thomas Hoover. Ian Spencer Horn, cum laude. Junga Wong. Douglas William Paulsether, summa cum laude. Nicole Evelyn Hunter. Katrina Jacqueline Hutton. Teresa Lucille Jackson. Mary Catherine James, cum laude. Miranda Eve James, summa cum laude. Rachel Elizabeth Janice, magna cum laude. Morgan William Jellison. Bria Kimnita Johnson. Cassidy Brian Jones. Hyenjin Jung. Jameson Michael Kazmarek. Krishna Murti Kenhai. Joshua Donald Kemp, magna cum laude. Nathan David Kemp, summa cum laude. Ryan Patrick Kennedy. Jasmine Day Kenny. Rhiannon Alice Margaret Kermode. Rohil Wahid Khan. Ashley Tatiana Kid Robinson. Benjamin Tyler King, magna cum laude. Nathaniel John Klung. Shannon Marie Klein. Brittany Marie Knowlton. Sarah Elizabeth Coburnett. Rebecca Marie Krupp, cum laude. Kang Lin Chi. Nicolette Marie Laird, magna cum laude, honors in bioinformatics. Hai Sun Lee, summa cum laude. He Min Lee, cum laude. Nil 
Nils Edward Lights, cum laude. Joshua Roger Lewis. Jackie Lee. Peter Liao Yudao. Nicholas John Liberco, summa cum laude. Andrew Gerald Linden, cum laude. Ellen Marie Lipo, cum laude. Dustin Archibald Locke. Nathaniel Nicholas Ayin Logie. Laura Elise Leeninghainer, cum laude. Archita Madhusadanan. Diana Marutian. Shrachandra Masabatala, cum laude. Honors in Financial Mathematics. Aaron Elise Matheny. Isaac J. Ferris McGeeson, cum laude, Honors in Physics. Brennan Wade McLaughlin. William Boyle McGowan. Eden McKissick Hawley. Cassie Lynn McLaughlin, cum laude. Angela Shantae McNeil. Holden Ryan Meyer, cum laude. Casey Neguit Mendoza, cum laude. Rebecca Danielle Merritt. Livia Castello Bronco Machias, magna cum laude, honors in English literature. I. J. Miller, summa cum laude, honors in history. Kate Louise Mishkin. Emily Rose Mooney, cum laude. Lindsay Marie Morgan, summa cum laude. Rachel Kathleen Morrissey. Pragyadita Chandra Mukherjee, magna cum laude. Bradley Wayne Musselman, magna cum laude, honors in chemistry. Rebecca Inez Nadler, cum laude. Morgan Lee Barton Nelson, magna cum laude. Grace Catherine Neubauer. Ang T. Van Nguyen. Stephanie Lee Nguyen. Viet Hong Nguyen. Kaylee 
Faye O'Brien, cum laude, honors in classics and visual studies. Abdusalam Moyasore Oganla, cum laude. Mitchell Dean Olson. Sydney A. Peccioni, cum laude. Chanteria Christopher Alexis Paredes. Colton Gable Parker, magna cum laude, honors in neuroscience. Ella Margaret Peterson. Robin Kiernan Larrabee Peterson. Larissa Alexandrovna Piragova. Natalie Anna Polichonsky, cum laude. Alessandra Catherine Aneshka Power, cum laude. Emily Ann Powers. Thonica Pradhan, cum laude. Brandy Todd Pudlow. Swetia Rajbandari. Juan Pablo Ramirez. Jadi Silu Ramas Orbe. Elizabeth Jane Reyes. Carmen Rabaudo, cum laude. Emily Peyton Roberts, cum laude. Jessica Alexandria Robinson. Caitlin Ann Rakow, cum laude. Jessica Rodriguez. Ellen Joanne Roulette. Chloe Elise Salk, cum laude. Linda Sanabria. Evelyn Santiago. Andrea Alejandra Santoyo. Tony Lee Sasaki, cum laude. Rahil Rizvin Savani. Adam Shalom Shrig. Julia Augusta Trouder, cum laude. Victor O'Connell Schultz, cum laude. Becca Michelle Schweter. Michelle Sarah Secunda, cum laude. Kiana Brielle Cepeda Miller, magna cum laude. Waipeng Shen. Arlo Evander Sheridan. Alice Ann Sherlock.
Duke Sang Dolma Sherpa. Carly Marie Shields, magna cum laude, honors in creative writing and screenwriting. Valencia Victoria Short. <laughs> Melissa Silva. <laughs> Amber Marie Simon. Jory Jessica Michelle Simon. Chase Cameron Scarda, cum laude. Megan Mariah Smith. Oliver Smith. Micah Niles Snowcob. Clayton Donald Susi. Sophia Irene Spooner, cum laude. Margaret S. St. Clair, cum laude. Casey Catherine Stashelsky. Kaylee Nicole Stahl. Benjamin Edward Stanger. Hannah Marie Steele, cum laude. Katiana Tira Lee Sky Stemple. Yeah. Stefan Jacob Still. Yeah. Matthew Sugai. Yeah. Jacob David Swider Rogers. Yeah. Carly Madison Taylor, magna cum laude. Daniel Christian Taylor. Mary Ann Candethil Thomas. Morgan Ashley Tonner, cum laude. Alana Marie Toomey, summa cum laude. Savannah Ann Trent. Grecia Alejandra Trevino. Inkjen Tumanjargal. Adam Patrick Turner. Elizabeth Caroline Tweedy. Havel Arter Rakowski. Sophia Elizabeth Uppadel, summa cum laude. David Esteban Valencia. Claire Elizabeth Vaughn, magna cum laude. Alejandra Vasquez. Stephanie Michelle Velas. Ruben Villalobos.
Sathara Vincent. Eric John Vogel, cum laude. Alexander Volkov, cum laude, honors in chemistry. Samuel Tucker Waldner, cum laude. Hazelie Marie Wallace. Dylan Misaki Walthers. Samantha Doreen Watkins. Caitlin Nicole Watts, Honors in Modern Languages. Julie Claire Wertheimer, summa cum laude. Alexander J. Wong. Emily Angelique Williams. Jasmine Lorraine Bernice Williams. Dion Tavis D. Williams Hightower. Yosef Benyaya Willis. Nien Nguyen, cum laude. Elizabeth Danielle Wisdom, cum laude. Mitchell Schulte Wise. Amelia Jameson Wiseheart. Elliot James Witt, cum laude. Nathaniel Thorpe Rosenberg. Leland Rain Wright, cum laude. Jacqueline Yabany. Peter Yang. Tegan Wenger Yausi, cum laude. Davi E. Ari Elias Yonashige. Allison Somi Yu. Jared Matthew Zanger. Jordan Dominic Zanger. Tomas Zarko. Sophia Theodoru Zervas. Zhu E. Mi. Zhen Xiao Yu. And Samantha Ann Zeme. Cum laude. I guess one of the lessons of this commencement is hang on to your hat. Just kidding.
going to wait till we get everyone back. There we go. Class of 2016, congratulations, felicitaciones to you, to your families, to your friends. It has been an intense four years. You have encountered disappointments, maybe even despair, the wind chill factor of minus 42. You have worked to exhaustion in the classroom, on the playing fields, on the courts, in the library. But you have also succeeded beyond your wildest dreams and fallen in love with people, with places, with ideas, and with causes. This class in particular, I thank you as you have spoken out with passion in defense of core values of respect, dignity, equity, and sustainability. You have changed each other and changed the college. And now you go out into the world. As you go, all of us on the stage feel the urgency to share with you our parting words. We are all so eager to tell you one last thing, but we have to let you go. As the great Galesburg poet Carl Sandburg observed nearly 80 years ago in this very place, we have to let you go because we have hope and faith in you. Here is what he said. What young people want and dream across the next 100 years will shape history more than any other motivation to be named. Over the past four years, you have developed the disciplined habits of an inquiring mind and a compassionate heart. We all have hope and faith that you, with your Knox education, will indeed shape history and that you will take up the many challenges of global citizenship to heal a troubled planet, to push back the frontiers of scientific knowledge, to bring home the millions displaced or imprisoned by climate change, violence, and persecution, to address the root causes of group hatreds. Pay attention, pay attention to the lives and the thoughts of others. Honor the sacrifice of your families, the dedication of our founders, our faculty, and our staff, follow the example of this year's honorary degree recipients. Like Senator Dick Durbin, serve the public good selflessly and stay the course. Like Dr. Brenda Child, seek the untold stories of those erased from history and give them voice. Like Chad Pergracki, reclaim the natural world and repair the planet. The care of this historic college now passes to your hands. Come back and visit whenever you can. Your alma mater will be here to welcome you home. Namaste.
Desmond Tutu is fond of repeating a quotation of his father. Don't raise your voice, improve your argument. By this, the archbishop does not mean to say that one should remain silent on the great issues of the day. Certainly, his life of activism demonstrates his willingness to raise his voice. Rather, the wisdom that he takes from his father is that when you speak, you must have something worth saying. Speak truth to power, the activist motto that comes to us through the American civil rights and peace movements, reminds us to be courageous and outspoken critics of the society in which we live. But the willingness to speak truth to power through complaint and protest are the first steps towards engaged citizenry in a democratic society. They are not the last. If your generation is to produce a society better than the one you were born into, you will have to use the full menu of skills provided by your liberal arts education. The ability to listen, to hear, and to understand those with whom you disagree. As you make your way in the post-Knox world, you will continue on occasion to speak your minds as you did as students. But you will also find that you will increasingly depend upon the listening and collaborative skills that you learned here at Knox. The willingness to hear ideas and people that you do not agree with or like is not a sign of moral weakness, but of intellectual strength. As Aristotle said, it is the mark of an educated mind to be able to entertain a thought without necessarily accepting it. It is through entertaining ideas and perspectives that we might find at first threatening that we foster cooperation, create new solutions to old problems, and move society forward. Nelson Mandela, the revolutionary fighter who went on to preside over a multiracial South Africa, said of his success, if you want to make peace with your enemy, you have to work with your enemy. Then he becomes your partner. Class of 2016, may you never lose your courage to speak truth to power. May you use your energies and creative intelligence to devise the solutions for the problems of your time. And may you continue to develop the wisdom and perseverance to work with those who see the world differently than you do, to build solutions that last. Congratulations. <laughs>